Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for uh, this day that we can come before you, that uh, we thank you for your love for your people. We thank you that um, you can speak uh, through Pastor Izzy to each one of us. We ask now that you send your Holy Spirit, um, just like that breeze is blowing in from the ocean, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would flow into our hearts and our minds, Lord, open us up so that we can be clay in the potter's hands, Lord, just uh, help us to encourage us and to uh, be equipped this week for how we can draw closer to you and walk with you. We ask that now in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. Would you open your Bibles to 1 John? This morning, we're going to be looking at chapter 4, the last couple paragraphs of the chapter. 1 John chapter 4, we're going to begin with verse 15 this morning. And um, it reads like this, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, it says that person is a, has God abiding in him. And it says, and he in God. God abiding. Abide means to what? To remain, to stay put, planted with you. And it's a, such a sweet thing when, you know, in our Christian experience, when we know that the Lord is with us, it, it changes our whole outlook on life. We don't feel lonely. You know, that's one of the sweetest things I think that I experienced as a new Christian was um, that factor of loneliness went down. Because I, I felt, you know, God, you said, if I stay with you, you'll stay with me. The scripture tells us if we just draw near to God, what will God do? He'll draw near to us. I mean, sometimes people make the gospel a little too complicated. They make it like too hard. All we have to do is say, God, here I am. I want to seek you. And he says, if you seek, you will what? You'll find. If you seek the Lord, you're going to find him. If you don't seek. Now, it doesn't say you won't find because he'll probably still show up in your life some place and cross the path with you. But but it doesn't. It's not the same as the person who is actually actively seeking. When we actively seek the Lord, he says, I'm here. I'm here to be found. And, you know, I think in Western Christianity, we've almost delegated the job of seeking God to the clergy. You know, tell the pastors to do it, the priests. You know, let those guys, the, the nuns, when I was growing up in the, in the uh, I, I was raised Italian, Roman Catholic kid, so we went to catechism and, 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 you know, I studied to be an altar boy. I had to learn Mass in Latin. We didn't actually do Mass in English. So uh, I was one of those weirdos that actually learned. I can't, I can't stand not knowing what they're saying when it's in a different language. So I learned Latin just so I could follow the Mass. And, and it's pretty neat when you know what it says. But how many people actually know Latin here? Anybody raise your hand that studied besides me? <laughs> I've got, is it someone said, I took it, but I don't remember. <laughs> it's not one of those really common spoken languages is it and because i grew up speaking italian as my first language uh, italian spanish you know these romance languages are called they they their origin is in latin so it's a lot easier for someone who knows those languages to learn latin than an english speaking person and i used to just sit there and wonder how many people actually understand what the priest is saying because they all sat there just well my older italian relatives they took it as an opportunity to experience the peace of God. <laughs> That's what all I can tell you, because every time the, the, the priest started the, the Mass in Latin, they went like this. They folded their hands, and they closed their eyes, and they looked so peaceful. And then they went to sleep for a power nap. You know, I don't know how that so many old Italian men knew when the end of the Latin Mass was, but it was like their eyes all opened when he said, Amen. They just opened and looked so peaceful, like that was wonderful. And at our parish, they actually, at St. Teresa's, they actually went to having Mass in English. You know what happened? Revolt. Everybody hated it. They couldn't understand what was going on. They couldn't sleep. <laughs> they actually, the, the, there was such a large contingent of our fellowship, what was, uh, was uh, our parish was Italians, that they actually demanded that they go back to Latin Mass or they were going to leave. And because... You know, they made up so much of the church, they went back to Latin. And I watched the older guys go back to sleep. 
And do you think that's really actively seeking God? You know, is that, is that what he's talking about? When you seek me, you'll find me? That you go to this place and you fall asleep and you don't want to hear what, what he has to speak to you? That's not seeking. That's not what I'm talking about today. That's not what I'm talking about when it says, you abide in him, you remain with him, and he'll remain, it says, with you. Now, this is a sweet, sweet message for our spirit to know. When we know that God wants to be with us, there's some, well, there's some perks to this. Let me read you what John has to say here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. He says, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love, well, he abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, it says, love is perfected or made complete with us so that we have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love does what? It casts out fear. This is one of the things it says, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love, it says, because he first loved us. When I t hear people saying, oh, I love God and now he loves me. And like that's not really scripturally accurate. The Bible says that God loved us even while we were yet sinners. We were off doing our own thing and God still loved us. And it says at the right time while we were sinning, he sent his son to die for us. And so Christ came and died for us even when we weren't seeking the Lord. And because of this, this is what John says, because God did that for us, he, sh he set this example. He showed us that he was the initiator of love, wasn't he? He loved us first. By the way, I know the guys don't like me to mention this, but in the book of Ephesians, when Paul is writing chapter 5, the, the passage where we get the vows for, the, for, for marriage, he tells the men, men, you have to love your wives like who? Like Christ loved the church. And then he gives all these things that Christ did. Christ laid down his life for the church. Christ sanctified the church. Christ washed the church with the washing of the water of the word. Christ presented the church with no spot, no wrinkle, nor any such thing. He did all this as an example for us men. When we, when we show our brides to the world, we're not to present them with, with every flaw that they have. I mean, you watch the television today. These guys have got it wrong. They're like, they're, they're mocking and, 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 and flagrantly waving the, the mistakes. They're, my wife burnt the toast and she messed up my egg and she popped the yolk. I hate it when the yolk is popped and blah, 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 blah. And they, they pick at every little thing. Guys, you better never be telling anything your wife did wrong. That's not your place. Gals, how do you feel when your husband does that? Feel good? No. Does Christ do that to us? Now, just a question. How many of you know this? Does Christ take our sin and wave it like a banner? Hey, everybody, look at I got a church down there. And they're messed up. Let me show you their sin. I'm going to get a blimp with a little sign behind. Izzy is a sinner. And he did all this. And, and Aaron and... And, and Holland, all these guys, they're all sinners. Well, of course we are. But does Christ present us as sinners before the Father? No, he presents us as his children who he loves and who he forgave our sins, who washed away our sins. That's how he presents us. That's how we're supposed to present our brides. You want to really have your wife fall in love with you guys, you don't blab anything that she's ever done wrong. In fact, in her eyes, she's perfect. In, in your eyes, she's perfect, right? You, you, she, you guys know my wife's perfect, right? For me, she is. None of you can have her either. <laughs> I learned this one from the Lord. I was just teaching the kids the Ten Commandments on Friday. And you know the first commandment says that the Lord our God is a what? A jealous God. And he tells us, how many gods should we have before him? None. None. So I tell everybody, look, I'm a jealous husband, and you, she'll have no other husbands before me. I mean, th this is it, you know. We're married for life. This, this is something that when we, when we realize this relationship, what God has for us, the more we learn of God's love toward us, 
the more we know how to love one another. It's just the way it goes. It says we know love because, verse 19, he first loved us. You want to know how to love someone? Look at how God loves you. Unconditionally. He doesn't love you and say, I love you as soon as you get it together. Boy, what a mistake that is. How many of you have met people who said, I'll go to church once I get my act together a little bit more? Are you supposed to get it together to come to God? Or come to God and let Him get you together? Because the Scripture doesn't teach, all ye who have got it together, then you may come to church. This is not a museum for the righteous. This is a hospital, I tell people, for the sick. Because I have the great physician. I work for him, Jesus. Isn't he called the great physician? Can he doctor up any problem we have? Whether it be in a, a heart or that's broken hearted. Can Jesus mend a broken heart? Can he fix somebody who's struggling with their faith? They feel a little bit weak in the faith. Can he strengthen their faith? Can he take someone whose mind is, is having trouble focusing? Maybe they're, they're, they're fragmented in their thinking. Can he m restore a mind? How big is your God? Mind can do anything. I mean, you read about him in the scripture and they bring J to Jesus people possessed. D he doesn't go, oh, can't do that one. I, I do everything else. I can heal lame, blind, sick. I can even raise the dead, you know. It's funny how we put limits on God that God didn't put. A, it's in our own minds. We think, I'm not sure if he could do this. But I'm here to tell you, he can take care of every problem we have. And because of a God that loves us so much, because he showed us that love by giving us his son, he says, now we know how to love one another. Now, let me show you what John says with, about this love. He says if, in verse 20, if someone says, I love God, but he hates his brother. Well, it says he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he can see, John says, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him, that, that the one who loves God, what's God's commandment? If you love God, what, what should we do? We should love our brother also. If you say, I love God, but I hate that person over there, you're not walking in the love of God. God wants to do a work in you. He wants to replace that hate with his love. Now, his love has some perks. Some beautiful perks. I like the one in verse 18. It says, in his love, there is no fear. Because perfect love, God's perfect love, casts out fear. Now, this is a kind of a peculiar one for me to expl explain because some of the passages in the Bible use the word fear, and it causes some confusion. I've even had kids tell me, but doesn't it say we're you know, supposed to fear the Lord? And yet God's love casts out. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's, it's English is a little confusing sometimes. They, pit, they use the same word with many meanings. Yeah, and even in a, in a you've you got to know the context to actually know what they're trying to convey. The best way I can explain it is this. I, I learned, in fact, I what I shared with the kids about the Ten Commandments. How many of you learned the Ten Commandments? I had to study those when you were a kid. Over and over. We used to have them on the wall at the parish. You know, they were right up there. Now, just to let you know, in Hebrew, the, the Ten Commandments are much easier to, for my brain to remember because in Hebrew, the, the Ten Commandments, the tablets are separated, two tablets. You guys have seen it, right? Two tablets that they have for the Ten Commandments. And in Hebrew, though the words are longer for the first four, they fill up the, they read from right to left, not left to right. So they... The right-hand tablet only has four commandments. They have a little bit more wording to each one. The left one has kind of shorter verbiage, except for the very last commandment. It's got a full paragraph in Hebrew. And it fills up the other side. So four on this side, six on this side. I know it's going to mess with some of you because you've got used to seeing the American picture, right? Five and five, and, and you think that's the way. Don't do that. It's harder for your brain to remember. Because if you know how the Lord laid it out. Uh, by the way, who wrote the first original tablets? God, God right? On the mountain. God is the one who put the first tablets out. So I'm pretty sure he knew what he was doing when he put four on one side and six on the other. In fact, I, I know why. Because if you study them, 
this is, by the way, for those of you like students of the word, you can look these up in Exodus chapter 20. Start at verse 3. It says, For I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God, and thou shalt have no other gods before me. First commandment. How many gods do we get? One. One. That's it. Second commandment. You should not fashion any image, any graven idol of uh, an image of things above in the heavens, the things on the earth, or the things beneath the earth in the sea. You can't, you know, carve a little birdie or critter down here on the earth or some fish from the sea and worship that. That's called an idol. So, you know, in growing up, we knew this one, number two. Don't have any what? Idols. No idols. Third one. You guys, I, 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 I'm sorry if I'm doing this, but I want to show you something about the commandments that helped me explain this fear thing, but I got to do the, the quick run through for it, if you don't mind. Just, just look at Exodus 20. Let me just show you so that you, that you can uh, see these things. You can uh, like put little highlight markers, and I'm going to put the first four of them together so that you see something. Hopefully, you'll catch it. Now, some of you already know. Don't give it away if you already know this, okay? Because this is, this is, for some people, this is exciting. They get to see something maybe they didn't get to learn in Sunday school. And the, f and the, and the third one is found in verse 7. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in what? In vain. In other words, you don't yell out his name and... The kids are asking, what's taking his name in vain? I can't. It's, it's using his name in in a swearing you know swearing out his name yelling it out and can you imagine if someone yelled out your name but they didn't say anything to you after that they just they just scream your name holland and holland looks over yes you know our <laughs> brother here holland that was handing out the bibles this morning holland now can you imagine if we all started doing this he's walking by holland holland damn it he'd be like what Curse, curse, curse. You know, when you shout out someone's name and they look to you, they look at you like, okay, you got my attention. What do you want to say? But when you say nothing except for a curse word, that's vanity, emptiness. You have used their name in vain. Now, I don't hear people yelling, oh, Buddha. Buddha, gosh darn it. No. Muhammad. Whose name did they usually shout out? Jesus' name. God's name. And the Bible teaches us, the third commandment is, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Do not do this. This is not something that you should do. And the fourth one that is on the right tablet in Hebrew, written by the Lord, is to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, a day of rest. It's time to take a day and don't do any work, it says, nor shall your, your daughter, your son, your, your male or female, so everyone who stays with you, they get the day off. Now, God is really uptight, isn't he? Do you know if you follow the Jewish customs and you take every week, you take one full day off to rest, and then you do like the, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths, the, 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 the Jewish Feast, Purim, the, these, these feasts that some of them go on weeks, two weeks at a time. If you do all the Jewish feasts, plus the once a, well, once a week you get a day off, so that's 52 weeks a year, or I'm sorry, 52 days of the year, add that to the other weeks, you actually take off, did you know this? You have to take off a whole third of a year and do nothing and rest. Any of you have any bosses that have told you, I'm going to hire you, but you're going to have to take a third of the year off, and I'm going to pay you full pay, but you can't work for a third of the year. Just two-thirds of the year, and I'll pay you the full amount. Anyone had that happen? Do the Jews still do this today? Do you know this? Yes. In Israel, they do. And I find it ironic that they work less, they take these days off to honor God and rest, and yet, when you look at their financial portfolios, my master's is in finance, it's interesting. The Jews seem to be financially more prospered per capita income than we are, and they work less. Now, who has it mixed up? Us or them? I mean, was God being mean, saying, you have to take some time off? The Bible says he knows our frame. 
He is mindful that we are but dust. He knows our dust can't handle working seven days a week. I've seen guys that grind for, how many of you know folks that have worked straight through a couple, couple weeks in it? They go for a month, not a day off. What happens at the end of the month? Meltdown, right? Crisis, physical illness starts setting in. Things go wrong. Our bodies were not made for it. Now, God isn't being uptight. He's trying to give you every week a day to reset that spiritual reset button in your spirit. You need a little refreshment to keep you going. Now, the reason that these first four are grouped together on the right tablet, to me, are very obvious because I've studied them, of course. Cheating, that helps. Because the other side starts off with the very first commandment on the, on the other tablet, the left-hand tablet in Hebrew, is, is commandment six. To honor thy father and thy mother. Right? What, what, what happened? That this is, a, this is um, an interesting one. This is the one that it says is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, what happens to the length of your life? What happens to your length of days? This is the first commandment with a promise. It says you will have your days prolonged if you honor your parents. God will give you length of days. He will extend your life. He will prosper you. The next one, most of you guys already know number seven in the list. Thou shalt not, what? Murder or kill. The next one, thou shalt not commit adultery. The next one, thou shalt not steal. And the last one, or I'm sorry, second to last, thou shalt not bear false witness. Or we were taught, you know, as Catholic kids, thou shalt not, what? Three-letter word, lie. Not good to lie. And the last one, thou shalt not covet. And this is the one in written out in the Hebrew that actually tells us not to covet anything that is of our neighbors. Nothing in their house, it says, you don't covet your neighbor's wife, you don't covet your neighbor's male servant, his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You're not to covet anything that is your neighbor's. Not their relationships, not their possessions, not anything. God gave that to them. That's what they need. Or maybe, they, you know, I taught the kids this. You have to be careful. Covetousness can lead you to a whole bunch of the other sins in the list. You know, if you really want something that someone else has, what's, what's our natural mind start doing when we see something someone else has and we want it? We're like going, how can we get it away from them? Maybe I could like, you know, finagle a little, let's have a little talk. Can I steal, I mean, could, could you, would you like to get rid of that cheap or, um, like, you want to give it away? I'll take it, you know, or, we, we have all sorts of things. And if they say, no, I don't, I really want to keep it. Now we're thinking, what could we do to get rid of them? This is, I'm sorry, that's my Sicilian side. It's the easy way to get stuff. Look, I bumped that guy off, I'll get anything he has. Now that might not seem like, your mindset may be far from that, God bless you. But when you're raised in a Sicilian household, you're thinking, that's an easy way to get someone else's stuff. Just get rid of them. All their stuff is now available. And if it was going to be passed on to someone else, you'd bump them off too. And you get it doesn't matter. Just get rid of the downline. You, you just step in and take it. Sin of covetousness can lead us to doing all sorts of evil to our neighbor. Maybe you're coveting your neighbor's, your, your, your neighbor's wife. There are people that have gone to great depths of sin because they coveted their neighbor's wife. Yeah, King David did that. And he wound up not only sleeping with Bathsheba, but then covering it by taking Bathsheba's husband and putting him to the front of the, of the military battle and having them withdraw. And actually, it's, it's indirect murder, isn't it? What he did. He murdered Bathsheba. Uriah was his name. A faithful man just because of his sin in his heart. Now these are things, all of these things on this side of the tablet from honoring your father and mother to not stealing, not lying, not, not all of these things, not coveting. These all have to do with what I call our relationship on the horizontal plane. Our relationship between one another down here. The first tablet have to do with our vertical relationship between us and who? God, our maker. It's the, it's the vertical relationship 
the first four commandments deal with. And once you know this, you won't ever forget it. The f- you know, someone's trying to fool you on which one's on which side of the tablet. You go, wait a minute. Does it have to do between me and God? You know, like the Sabbath thing. Why do we need a rest? Because we need a spiritual what? Connection, refreshment from the Lord. We need to be taking time with him. That's us, our vertical relationship. What about the idol thing? No idols. Is that between me and others or is that between me and God? Right? It's between me and God. You, you, won't, you won't ever forget this once you know how they're separated. They're separated. One tablet dealing with everything you do down here on the horizontal plane. How you deal with other people, not to lie, with them, not to, lie to them, not to commit adultery. That's not lying with them. You do anything on this horizontal plane. That's the whole left-hand tablet. Now, the reason I point this out is in Jewish culture, when Jesus was tested by this attorney, he came to me and said, this lawyer, what's the greatest command in the scripture? And Jesus said, well, how's it read to you? Anyone remember the lawyer's response? The young man in Mark, he says, Matthew, I believe, also records this for us. I'm not sure it tells you he's an attorney there, but I think it's over in Mark. You can look that up for me. He says, well, um, it says we should love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, you know, Leviticus, and we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves, right? And then Jesus, right, this is what you do in that game where you got, they get it. Right on, you got it, on the nose. Perfect. He goes, go therefore and do it. And he goes, well, who's my neighbor? He says, wishing to justify himself. He, he wanted to know who's his neighbor. We studied that. He gave him the whole parable of the, of the good Samaritan, told him about the Samaritan that took care of the guy that fell into the hands of the robbers and proved to show compassion. And then he told that man, he said, you go and do likewise. Now, I don't know if you picked up on this, but the greatest command is basically a boil down of the Ten Commandments. The first side of the tablet, you to God. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. The second tablet, by the way, if you love your neighbor as yourself, would you lie to your neighbor if you love them as, would you want someone to lie to you? Would you? It covers every single one of the Ten Commandments, by the way. Love is the fulfillment of the commands. So he makes it really simple. John, when he's writing this to us, he goes, guys, this is the commandment that we have, that the one who loves God, okay, that's the vertical. How many love the Lord? Raise your hand. Let's see. Oh, man, we got good. This is, then all we have to do now to fulfill the whole rest of the deal is you love God, and then every one of you that loves God has to love who? His brother. Look around. You think, I didn't want to love that person. I didn't come to church to love them. I just came to hear about God. (laughs) Sorry. It's a package deal. You know, you can't say, I love God, but I don't want to love the the people he's put around me. You know what? We need love. This culture is so dysfunctional. I'm, I'm really glad I grew up in an Italian household. See, in an Italian household, you grow up, you wake up in the morning, and the first thing you hear from your parents is how much they love you. You never hear, the, you know, y- y- and you go, you go around other relatives and, and friends, and they're always, you know, as you walk in, there's these gre- We used to have a greeting line. When we went to go see the relatives to get together for a holiday, you open the door, and there they would, they would hear the car coming, and all the relatives in the, that were already there would jump up and get to the door, and it was always by, um, how do we call it? Uh, I'm trying to think in English. The patriarch, the matriarch, the, you know, the oldest going down the line to the youngest, they get to go first, the oldest. So, so you come in the door, there's your grandma, Nona, and, and Nono, you get a hug and a kiss. And then, you, and Sia, and Sio, your uncle, and your, your aunt, and your uncles, and, and they hug you, and they kiss you, and and they pinch your cheeks a lot. Okay, I mean, I'm sorry, but if you're not used to that, you probably freak out a little. Because by the end, they turn all red because they really <laughs> dig in sometimes, you know. <laughs> you know, and they shake your cheek a lot. And by the end, you're, and, and by the end of the line, you know, you go through 15, 20 relatives. That's just if you got there early. 
Okay? And, and you get, you, you know, it, the later you come, the more there's going to be. And you're going to get really, by the end, you'll be like, whoa, red everywhere. And you're also going to have, like, kiss from Sia here and Nona here, lipstick here, here, on the head here. You know, when you're little, it's all over the face, man. <laughs> and you get to the end of the line. You can smell your, your, your aunt's perfume on this shoulder, your uncle's cologne over here. You know, you, you, sm you can got kiss marks all over. You don't get to the end of the line and go, man, I don't feel loved. <laughs> you're like, you go running up, and you, it's so weird. It's like, we, we didn't go, oh, yuck, let's get that off. It was like, I'm loved. Now, is it good for a child to know they're loved? Yes. And our culture is so dysfunctional at even just saying to someone that you love them. It, it, for some people, I know they didn't grow up with this because it almost takes them by surprise if I say, oh, I love you, praying for you, you know. I'm, I'm hanging up at the end of the conversation. Okay, I'll be praying for you. Love you. Talk to you later. And they're like, up, uh, I don't know what to say. Like if you say to an Italian... You know, the end of the conversation is coming and you're saying, saying your goodbyes, ciao, ti amo. They don't go, ti amo is, by the way, I love you. They don't go, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. they go, ciao, ti amo. Anchio means also. They just, it's like common to just say in parting, you know, I love you. In Hawaiian, we say aloha. What does aloha mean? Hello, Hello goodbye, some of you think. It's love. Does it we were made for love. We were made for love from God, and we were made for love to our brothers and sisters, to love one another. And if we don't abide in that love, here's what happens. When we stay in that love of God and we love one another, there's a beautiful thing that begins to happen in our lives. He says God in the scripture, God is love. And God wants to be with you. His love will be with you. Now, this thing about perfect love, God's perfect love, how much fear does it get rid of? All of our fears. Do you remember in the psalm, Psalm 23, that, that beautiful psalm? It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear how much evil? No evil. For thou art what? With me. I'm here today to proclaim to you God wants to be with you so that you don't have to be afraid. His perfect love will cast out all fears. You walk to the valley. That doesn't sound like a good stroll, by the way. The valley of the shadow of death. Huh? Anyone here going, yeah, that's great. Let's go for a stroll. No. But in the valley of the shadow of death, God says, I will be with you. I'll never leave you, Jesus said. I'll never forsake you. I'm with you to the ends of the age. This is like the greatest comfort. Now, because of some other scriptures, and the, I love teaching kids because they're, the, they're right quick to pick up on these things. They say, but doesn't it say something about um, there's one that we're supposed to fear? And I said, you're right. That's in Luke's gospel, chapter 12. And it's, by the way, written by Jesus. The one we're supposed to fear, he says, don't, in verse 4, Luke 12, 4 says, my fr I say to you, Jesus said, my friends, do not be afraid of those that kill the body and after that have no more power. What? There's nothing else they can do. You think, what? Don't be afraid of those. By the way, if you studied psychology at all, I had to do this one of those mandatory classes. What is the greatest fear that all fears are rooted in, according to psychologists. So some of you already know this. You had to take the class, too. What is the what is the universal common fear of all men? Fear of what? Death. And in that, they say all fears are, are branched from that fear, like fear of heights. By the way, most people aren't technically afraid of heights. What are they really afraid of? Falling. No, they're not actually afraid of falling. It, what, if you boil it down, it's not the falling. In fact, there are people pay good money to jump out of airplanes just for the sensation 
of falling, right? But they have these little things on their back, poof, to pop out, hopefully, that slow down the end of the fall. Because the part we're really afraid of is not when we have one of those on our back and it opens. It's if it doesn't open. Splat. That sudden not opening of the thing will introduce us to the root of all fears, death. If you live through it, it's a bad, bad day. Well, we have fears. Fears that, that people, now some people, tell my wife told me, thank God you're the one that has to get up front because if I had to get up there, I would just, I'd, I'd just die. I mean, I'd, I'd, so you know, they say the fear of public speaking is sometimes equated to almost as bad as the fear of death. For some people, they would rather die than have to get up in front of the of folks and talk. It's just a strange thing that all of these fears that we have come from th this root fear of this body dying. So I'm afraid I'll get cancer or for the gals. I'm afraid I'm going to get breast cancer. Then I'm going to get the, that. will spread to my body. And then I'll die and I'll be gone for my kids. And, I'm gonna, and so what's your ultimate fear? Death. Now, Jesus says, I say to you, my friends, don't be afraid of anybody who can just kill this body. Don't fear it. What does he say we should fear instead? And by the way, this is where the kids were smart. They were paying attention. I could tell someone paid attention. They said, oh, we read a verse that says there's someone we should fear. <laughs> Listen to this. This is a good one. And some of you already know this intuitively. You're going to go, oh, yeah, I got that already. He says, but I warn you, Jesus says, Luke 12, 5, I warn you whom you are to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you to fear him. And by the way, in my Bible, I, I can cheat because it has a capital H for him. Why do they put those capital H's on pronouns in the Bible? You know, he with a capital H or him. What, what are they signifying? Deity. The translators do that out of respect. They're saying, fear God. How many of you guys know the proverb says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Or you read a couple pages later, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. The fear of the Lord leads us into so many beautiful things. All wisdom that we need, all knowledge that we need. Fearing Him, by the way, is the only one you need to fear. Now, this is kind of a strange word to translate to you to English because fearing him is actually from a word what we use in the old English. King James Bible used to translate fear the king. When, they, when, the, when the people would come into the courtyard of the king, the, the presence of a king, and the, and the guy who was at the door would call out the, the cry, fear the king. What did everyone do? They all bowed, right? They all acknowledge his authority. It was considered an act of, of revering, of reverence, saying, we honor that you have the position of rulership. You're the one, fear to you. In other words, it doesn't really sound, I, how about reverence instead of fear? That's a, probably a closer English word that would get the right idea in your mind. You need to revere God for who he is. He's a holy God. There's no one like him. How many gods do we get to have? One. No other gods before him. Get that right. Revere him first. And that will be the beginning of all your wisdom, of all of knowledge. It will, that's where it starts, when you acknowledge him first, your creator. And when you do that, the rest of the ducks, they just line right up. Fear the Lord. That's who Jesus said. Fear him who after he takes life from your body has the authority to take you and cast you what? Into hell. He's like, you should probably feel, fear that guy. The one who is, <laughs> you know, don't be afraid of someone who's just going to touch your body down here. That isn't really, that's like looking way too temporal. You know, that's like short term. Ta we're talking eternity. You guys realize that we have spirits inside these shells? They're made to live for eternity. You need to fear the one that has the, the power to judge over where your spirit will go. Not be afraid of man down here. Fear him. 
Now, interestingly enough, even though it's the same word, I'll, I'll say revere him, reverence him, keep him in holy awe of who he is, and all the rest of your relationships down here will begin to come into view the right way. Jesus said it. He said, are not five sparrows sold for two cents, and yet not one of them is forgotten before God? Indeed, even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Now, do not fear, for you are more valuable than sparrows. Here's some of the fears we have. Am I valuable? Isn't this interesting? The first fear Jesus deals with is your value. He says, look at the sparrows. How, how much they... Boy, it was cheap back then, wasn't it? Five sparrows for two cents. Two cents, get five sparrows. And yet, he says, not one of them is forgotten before God. Now, how much more value are you? I love that he used that example of the birds. Look at the birds. You know, when you start feeling like, does God really care about you? Just look at the birds. It says they don't. They don't sow, nor do they reap. They don't gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He knows everything they need, and he takes care of them all the time. You know, sometimes we freak out about, you know, how are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? What are we going to put on? Remember Matthew 6? Jesus says the Gentiles, they eagerly seek these things, and they worry about it. They're afraid. Jesus, don't be afraid. Because to God, he knows every hair on your head. And he says, do not fear. You are more valuable. First thing you fear is your value. And, and, and Jesus makes sure you know that to God, you are more valuable than any of these birds. And God looks after them every day. And verse 8 says, Luke 12, 8, I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, what would the Son of Man do? says he will confess you before who? Before the Father and the angels of God. He's, he says, but he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. But this, this idea, God is a holy God and his spirit is holy, don't take it lightly. It's important. When they bring you before synagogues and rulers and authorities. Uh-oh. Public speaking. In front of rulers. Some of you are going, uh, uh, I'm not in the stomach already. Jesus, don't worry about what you should say. Or what to speak in your defense. Or, 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 or how you're supposed to, to act. Don't worry about any of these things. The Holy Spirit will teach you, it says in that very hour, what you ought to say. You don't even have to be afraid when you're drug into public speaking and you don't want to do it. Because who helps you? The Holy Ghost. That's one thing any good Bible teacher learns is dependency on the leading of the Holy Ghost. Because you could have a message, all oh, that you studied and prepared, and, pre and you get there and you look at the audience and you're like, um, Lord, I was going to do the whole, you know, come to Jesus and I'm preaching to the choir. They're already all Christians. You know, it doesn't really work. And he's like, yeah, you weren't listening last night. I got a glad you finally opened up your ears. <laughs> and he could, Jonathan, does this ever happen? The Lord changes your sermon on the, on, all the time. You know, one of the things is he's God. And he has his Holy Spirit, and it's real. His Spirit, that's one of the signs John said that we would know that he is with us. It says, because he gave us his Spirit. And his Spirit can teach you things. He can lead you. He can guide you. I've, re I, I've said this before, and I know it's not popular to teach in a, in a culture where everybody wants, how do I say this tactfully? They want the, the I know people that say, listen, I'm going to put money in the box, you know, the, the Thai box, pastor, and you go talk to God for me. And then come back and give me, the, give me his answer because, you know, you, you, you're kind of like this with him, and you could do it for me, and I'll just give a little money, okay? And I think, wait a minute. Am I, spo am I supposed to go to God for you, or are, am I supposed to tell you to go to God direct? What, what, what's the Bible teach to do? Now, I'm not saying what does men teach as traditions in churches. Go boldly to the cross. Go boldly. Yeah, that's right. 
Hebrews 4, 16, let us draw near with confidence unto the throne of what's it called? The throne of what? Grace. That we might receive grace and mercy in our time of need. The, the author of Hebrews says, let us draw near with confidence. Every one of us, not send the pastor and have him come back and tell you what God said. That's not scriptural. I know because praying raised Catholic, we were told, give money, let the priest do the job. He'll come tell you if God has anything important to say. Otherwise, just tune in next week. And you know the bummer about that was? It made me feel far away. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was connected to God. I didn't feel that thing what John is talking about where I abide in him. I remain with him and he remains with me. I felt like he was, the priest was doing the remaining and I was just floundering. And that's not scriptural. God wants you to draw near to him. He wants to draw near to you. He wants to be with you. How many of you know the Lord is with you right now? You know that God is with you. Is that a good feeling? Yeah. And how many, t how many sermons have you heard about God being with you? You know, over the years, you have, think about it. You ever hear a preacher really drive home the point, the Lord is with us? Does it ever, by the way, for, for those of you that have heard it, who's heard it more than once here that the Lord is with you? More than five? Ten times, maybe. Ten messages? Sad that you haven't heard at least ten times. Because I, I don't know about you, but every time I hear the Lord is with me, you know, I get that reminder. What's that do to my fears? They go away. When he abides with me, his perfect love does what to the fear? Drives them away. Whatever fear it is, he just, just his presence with me makes the fear dissolve. And I got to tell you the truth. It's really probably something spiritually. Maybe we should have, um, well, the only reason I say this is maybe we should have at least one day a year appointed to preach this message that God is with you and that his love casts out fear, just as a reminder. In fact, I submit to you, we probably need it more than once a year. You know why I say this? Because there's a phrase that's used in the scripture, do not be afraid. Fear not. Do not fear. In Hebrew, it's all from the same two words. But it gets translated loosely in different passages to different phrasings. But it, it means, that, uh, look, does it say the same thing to you? If, if I say, fear not, do not be afraid, you know, it, to me it's the same thing. Do you know how many times that that phrase appears in the scripture? Some of you guys are going to be shocked. Over 356 times. Yeah, wait, how many days a year do we have? Three, I, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I said it wrong. Three hundred Over 365. It's actually 367 that I counted. There is more do not be afraid, more fear not, than there are days in a year. There's like more than one a day. Repeat, you read this book, you're going to like this book. Because there's one for every day of the year. You, you'd be like thinking, but today I'm a little afraid, Lord. Fear not. You might get to Joshua chapter 1. Do not be afraid, Joshua. Only be, of, be, be strong and of good courage. By the way, if you read Joshua 1 and 2, I love it. God speaks to this man, Joshua, who he's going to raise up to lead the children of Israel. The next leader after this really important dude in the Bible. Anyone know whose place he takes? Moses's. Hmm. That's a big shoes to, right? Big shadow to walk in. And, and, and I wonder, why does God repeat four times in two chapters, Joshua, do not be afraid. Only be strong and of good courage. The Lord is what? Oh, you guys, I forgot to tell you this part. You said it. The Lord is what? With you. Hmm. Do you guys know that on that day, God didn't even wait to the next day to tell Joshua? Can you imagine having to hear four times from God in the same day? I got a question for you. If God, 
Is God a broken record? He had to say this four times to this guy? Well, well what's wrong with Joshua? I submit to you, he was afraid. He was truly afraid. When someone is truly afraid, they need to hear more than once, fear not. They need to hear more than once, the Lord is with you. They need to hear more than once, don't be afraid. God is with you. Now you might be speaking this to one of your friends and they're still afraid. Don't give up. You know, you might go a couple weeks with not needing to hear that, but then you might have a crisis and you need it four or five times that day. I told you on average there's at least one a day. But some of you need five or six today. And that'll get you through the rest of the week. You need it to sink in. Sometimes we have to hear the same message, don't we? Till it actually, I, I call it, the, how, how far is the journey from in here, you know, goes in the ear to the brain, but it doesn't really sink down to this part. There's a difference, by the way, between head knowledge and heart knowledge. You know, w when you know something up here, you might intellectually know it, but when it drops, this, what is this, the, the, the nine-inch journey, they call it or something? Eight inches for some of you? From here down to here, when you go from knowing God is with me up here to God is with me in here, something happens to your fear. Your fears might dissipate when it sinks in. And I think it's the most, sometimes it just needs to be repeated. The Lord is with you. How many of you know that? Amen? Amen. Amen. The Lord is with you. Don't forget that because when you know he is with you, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. You don't have to fear evil because the Lord is with you. You don't have to fear feeling no worth. Because to God, you're more valuable than the sparrows. That fear will go away. You don't have to be afraid of going in front of people and sharing your faith. You confess Jesus before men, he's going to confess you before the Father. Don't worry about it. You're, you're covered. There's a great confidence that happens when, you know, sometimes the, if no one has ever experienced this, the first time that you share that you have faith in Jesus, it might be a little scary. Can anyone remember when you first did it? You told someone, I, I became a Christian. And you might have been a little bit nervous about it. But as soon as you confessed him before men, Jesus says, I'm confessing you before the angels, before my father. I, I got you covered. Does that do something for your faith inside? When you know he's, wow, he, he's got me covered. Well, I want to encourage you. This part is so sweet. When we get this together, we just start acknowledging God for who he is. Our vertical relationship comes in line, and all of our horizontal relationships down here, they come into balance too. We love God and we love our brothers. And now all we got to do is just stay with him. Keep abiding in him this week, and he'll abide with you. And don't be afraid. Whatever it is you're fearing, just remember, we got a lot of fear knots in here we can use. I can pretty much find one for every situation. When someone comes to me, but Pastor, you don't understand. Well, I'm afraid of this, right? I'm afraid of that. I'm like, oh, let me just show you right here. The more you know this book, you find out there is a, there's a fear knot for everything we fear, isn't there? There's just one in the book that God knew our frame. And even though, how many of you heard this fear knot message come up before? You know what? You might not need it for you today. Maybe God is just speaking it to you as a reminder because who's, gonna, who's God going to use? Maybe he's going to use Phaedra to tell one of her coworkers to fear not. Maybe he's going to take you this week and make you the one to help com comfort and console someone else who's afraid. There, this, is a, this is a message from his spirit, I believe, to our spirits. So we would not be afraid. You know, people are calling me up lately. Gosh, Pastor, don't you think with all this stuff in the world and ISIS and all this, it's getting scary out there. And what would Jesus say? Fear not. Do not be afraid. I'm with you even to the ends. Didn't he say this? Even to the ends of what? Of the age. 
Don't be afraid. If we're in, you know, guys, I do believe we're in the last days. I don't know when the Lord's coming. I hope, like I always say, I hope it would be at the end of the sermon right now. We got clouds. Lord, you could just blast the trump, part the clouds. We all go together. And for the rest of eternity, I'll be going, I told you, didn't I tell you he was coming soon? I didn't know when, but I knew it was soon. I could just, you know, you guys couldn't stand me for the rest of eternity. I'd be like, I told you. What a great way to end the sermon. That was the exclamation point on the whole message. You didn't believe me, did you? You know, man, this is, could be it. This, guys, we really actually don't know how much longer we have. The scripture says today is an acceptable day of salvation. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't know that Jesus died for you, stick around after. Ask. We got, how many of you guys would be willing to tell someone about the Lord if they, if they want to know? See all these hands up? Just ask anyone with their hands up, and they will tell you about how you can have eternal life in his, it, from the Lord. All you have to do is put your faith in Jesus. And we celebrate that together. But I want you to go away from here not governed by fear. Governed by love. Let love be your, your motivator. Let love be the thing that, that powers you this week. His love. And let that love pass on to the ones around you. When you see them afraid, just, just say, don't worry. Don't be afraid. God, has, God is with us. Remind them of that. It will really help. I, I tell you, the impact we could have in our community if we would let God's love flow through us. You might even get bold enough to tell someone you're praying for them like I do, praying for you and love you. You're allowed to do that, by the way. You know, it, it wasn't, this is my suggestion that you love one another, right? What was it? This is my commandment. Why don't you practice with me? Turn towards someone and tell them you love them and the love of the Lord. See, it's, I'm just, I'm getting you warmed up, okay? Do it again. That was really weak, you guys. I'm sorry. That was like, I, you can, you can, you know, there we go. Let's close with that thought. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you can pour it out into our hearts, our minds. Lord, as we go from here, pour it out through our lives to the people you put us around. We just ask that you would fill us to overflowing with your love. And we thank you, Lord, for your love and that love that, that casts out fear. We pray for anyone here who has fear that is, is crippling them, that's holding them back. Lord, pour out your love in their heart this morning that they could be freed from that. That we could go from here just celebrating your goodness that you are with us. Lord, we ask that now in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Would you guys stand with me? Let's sing this song. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.